Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we're going to be talking all about coding and programming. We have several great co-hosts today, and as we get into that, we want to talk about some of the latest and greatest things that are happening today in the world of education. Of course, we're here live every single Tuesday night over on TeacherCast.tv, and we're also broadcasting live on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, and also on your favorite video network. I want to bring in our co-host, Mr. Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I am doing great. I managed to help the fifth graders today repair the faculty microwave. That is pretty cool. Is that a, is that a, a book? Is that a code thing? What, what is that? Uh, we, we actually 3D printed a piece that would allow the microwave to function again. That's pretty cool. It was amazing. They had a good time with that? They had a really good time with it. I think they may have done a really bad job, but we'll see. Very nice. <laughs> also bringing on our show, Mr. Rob Pennington. Rob, how are you today? I am doing fabulous. Thank you for asking. How we uh, we actually just got our 3D printer up and running, Sam. So Nice. Uh, we have some kids really excited about the possibilities. That's pretty cool. I encourage you to find a way to make it relevant. Oh. That is That is the key, isn't it? Yeah. And also joining us tonight is Josh. Josh, how are you today? A little sore, but all in all, things are well in the northeastern Wisconsin. Very, very cool. Welcome, everybody, to the Tech Educator Podcast. We are here on the hashtag Tech Educator. We also have a live audience over on TeacherCast.tv. Please, if you're here tonight, feel free to leave us comments and uh, leave us some feedback here. We are here to help you guys every single week. We're going to start today with our new segment of what is new in ed tech. I don't know if you guys heard today, but Google dropped a blog post on us talking about a brand new Google Classroom. I want to take you guys through it. This is a, a screenshot here of what Google Classroom used to look like. Um, calendar. We have our cal sorry, calendar, I should say. Cal uh, we have our, our main calendar on the left side with our my calendars, our other calendars, and you can see it's a nice little layout. And then suddenly... Boom. Big numbers. Everything on the left side is just slightly different. And, and and I don't know. Have you guys had a chance to look at this? I've been beta testing this. Can we just round table this? Who hates that? I, I hate it. No, 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 no. It. It's horrible. I, I honestly, horrible. Sam, I had the same impression as, as you. Because when I first started this, of course, everything was different. Um, and, and it looks like there's less room for my stuff. No, 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 not actually. If you look at this over here, you, you do figure out where some of these things are. For instance, here's the schedule day, right? So in one little drop down box, we have day, week, month, as opposed to over here where they have it all on, like, on one long row. So I like that it's more compact. I also like when you click on something, you can add a title, you can make it appointment slots. You can do a lot more stuff here with this than you can. Now, one of the other neat things about this is that you've got all these... It's hard to explain. I, I, over the last few weeks, I've gotten used to this. Um, I do like it better. As I just said, it, it was a little bit of a transition, but if I want to add a, a, a an event, make it all day, I can find a time, which I, I got to tell you, is something that most teachers don't realize is here, is this find a time button, so you and somebody else in a, in a domain can figure things out. Um, all of your calendars are right here that you can add to. You can say busy or free. I mean, it, I'm going to discard this one here because this is my personal calendar. But there are so many different things that you can do here. If you go to the settings page, it is different, right? So here's the new settings page. Everything is kind of in one line here. It kind of goes up and down as opposed to in traditional calendar where if we have our settings, you have this whole calendar general labs thing. Um, to my knowledge... Much like where Gmail is going, they took out labs. So if you're using some of those calendar labs, don't be looking for it right now. But it's pretty cool. It's pretty neat to use. Um, that is one of the brand new things that Google has popped out today. Is this the first time you guys are seeing it, or have you guys had a chance to play with it yet? It's the first I've seen it, Jeff. What I wonder is the last Google thing that came out that we were looking at had a lot of new app scripts capability that it hadn't had before was that slides i think that was slides yes and i'm wondering are we looking at i can't say that i know what the old version of calendars app script ability was but are we looking at something that is at least as compatible with these app scripts as before because 
calendar events are great things to automate. It is, and and I don't know the answer for that. I, I'm, you know, maybe someday on a show we'll we'll sit and take a look at this. I personally am not an app script guy, so I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. Um, but like I said, it, it took me a while to have this grow on me. Um, I do like that up here. They they kept this search bar. This kind of pops out here as you're talking. Um, Whereas over here, it's just kind of big and clunky, this whole search calendar thing. I also like that over here above all your calendars, it says add a coworker's calendar. That's nothing new. That was actually down here in other calendars. But you'd be surprised of how many teachers have never seen that button before. Or they might have had it all, um, you know, minimized or so. I mean, th once you get into this, I'm finding that I like this better. I really do. Um it seems a little more intuitive. Um, I think that that is one of just from a functionality standpoint, uh, the other calendar, you could find certain things, but you had to dig deep and you had to play a little bit from what you're showing. And this is my first time seeing it. It just looks like it's a little bit more user friendly. It, 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 and I think that's the right way of looking at this, Rob. It is user-friendly. Um, clearly, Google is still moving towards this brand new ecosystem, right? You know, um, Gmail is, the, I, I think, the next in line to get a big uh, push. C clearly, we've seen Classroom go through an overhaul and sites have gone through an overhaul. Slides just got a bunch of new features. Not quite yet a major overhaul yet, but, you know, Slides, Doc Sheets, they all have that same ecosphere. Um, I'm really waiting to see what they do with Google Drawings and to see how that works out. But um, what is the rollout? Josh, you were looking at the blog post on this. There is a rollout coming soon for how this is going to work. Let me pull up the blog post here. Uh, time for a refresh. Meet the new Google Calendar for web. Um, if you're watching this live and you go to calendar.google, don't expect to see it quite yet, especially if you're on a an educational domain. You have to make sure that your uh, admin is set to push these things out. But I think what they're saying, Josh, maybe you can take, help me out with this. By the end of November, everybody should be seeing this. Well, I know that in the blog post, if you've got a personal account, um, it should be coming soon. It says starting today. So my guess is that they're just kind of gradually rolling that out. Um, and, and then when it comes to Google Apps domain, usually what happens is if you're in the, there's the rapid release and then there's the scheduled release, um, those two options in the domain uh, settings, so if you're rapid release, and I'm going to try and dig up the calendar here, um, it's usually right away. So somewhat soon, those schools that are rapid release should be getting those. Otherwise, the scheduled release usually lags about two weeks behind the rapid release. Another new thing that I want to bring it to your attention to is on the weekend, or I should say the week of November 7th through November 13th is the second annual Learn OneNote convention. This is a fantastic free 100% online event um, brought to you by our friends. Uh, it's not a, an official Microsoft event, but everybody here that is going to be presenting, I believe, is a Microsoft innovative educator. It's got some great sponsors. I will say that. And of course, if you look at some of the great things that are happening here in the great sessions, uh, let's scroll down here. We have um, business productivity, the power of ones using OneNote with OneDrive, introducing the OneNote app, uh, using OneNote to organize. And let me see if I can scroll down here to a very, very important thing. Uh, let's see as we go down here. So I'm going to be doing a session called setting up your podcast for success using Microsoft OneNote. I'm going to show you guys how I organize all of our shows here using OneNote, how we put all the audio in, the videos in, the uh, how, how I basically have used OneNote to completely revolutionize the organization and productivity here on the set. So I um, want to say thank you to everybody at the organizing team. Jared's done an amazing job there, but check that out. Um, it looks like that's going to be on, let's see, 10 a.m., Pacific time. They're going to be sharing that on one of those days. So we're going to have more information. We're getting a sidebar widget over on teachercast.net. So check that out. Um, but a great conference. It was really, really fun doing that last year. Today, we're going to be talking all about coding and programming. Sam, you have an interesting conversation here about why coding and programming skills are important. And I know we're getting ready here for the Hour of Code. Um, we were talking before the show starts. The Hour of Code is, of course, in December. 
I, I got to ask you the question that people in my school district are asking me. Should we be worried about doing an hour of coding? We've been doing this now for four or five years. Right. Like <clears throat> the hour of code, I think, is, is one of those things that can be really transformational the first time you run it through a school, especially if you're trying to get everybody in the school coding in that exact same hour. Because, oh my goodness, the access you must have at your school to pull that off. Not only the Wi-Fi support, but just the working devices. But, you know, like our schools have always done an hour of code within a week. And that's, it's really an entry event, right? We might, we still have a coding event during that week because it gets hyped up, but we're coding all of the time. Um, if your school... And the hour of code is kind of thing where if your school is a school that doesn't code or doesn't code enough, use the hour of code to get more people thinking about coding and using it and trying out more tools. It's a great way to say, hey, we're going to spend a little bit of time shopping for ideas. Um, but if you do the same thing every year, you can no longer call it innovative, right? So if all you're doing is putting your kids on the hour of code, code.org website every year, and giving them an hour and then calling it after that, then no, you probably don't need to do it again. So I'm looking over here at the Hour of Code website, which is hourofcode.com, and we'll see here that last year there were officially 9,526 registered events. Now, I'm 100% certain that that number is much, much, much higher because not everybody registered. Mm -hmm. But... When we're looking at this, as you said, Sam, number one, not everybody's doing this at the same time. You know, there's still schools that don't have one device and we can do it for an hour. And second of all, coding and program is nothing new at this point. Is it important that we do it? Yes. Is it important that we teach our kids this throughout the year, not just to do the hour, but how do we bring coding and programming into social studies, into science classes, into the English classes? Well, you, you... and to be fair, Hour of Code was, uh, you know, designed to be part of Computer Science Education Week. And the idea is to raise awareness about computer science education because the United States has no standards for computer science education that have been nationally adopted. This puts them behind other countries that have national standards for computer science education. They're required to code in kindergarten in Great Britain. And by code, I mean they use text-based coding. Like, that's, that's a requirement. It's intense. It's awesome. And that's also the, you know, the, the group of people that have given us the micro bit and the Raspberry Pi. So God bless them. So here's a Bye. question that I want to I want to start with here, Sam, and I, I want to see I want to get your opinion. And please, anybody out there that's listening or that's watching this live, am I correct in thinking Hour of Code was created in the previous administration? This was an, um, was this was this an, I think was, so. was this an Obama? Not necessarily Obama created, but this was in the last I mean, eight I, years. I, I right? certainly know that Obama supported the the very first hour of code and that ended up a lot of those same people ended up being worked into his innovative education plans and strategies is this going to go away like everything else well it's bigger than any you know the code.org is its own organization and its own fundraising group and they have their own mission and when they can enjoy the favor of you know the politicians they do and when they don't they still keep working i know that there are other organizations like girls who code i think it was girls who code has recently said things like you know we're good we don't need to continue a partnership with the government in order to continue to do the work we do in fact in some ways we feel like we would rather continue the work we do without that support so good to know because I, I, you know, in, in a world where everything seems to be getting dismantled, it is certainly nice to see that some of these things are here. So today, Sam, we're going to talk about three different things that we can do now. Like as we're recording this, it's October the 17th. December's far, far away, but it's going to come before we know it. We're looking at three things that we can do to prepare our students for the hour of code or to get ready for computer programming. And the first thing that you're talking about is to get into Minecraft education. Talk to us a little bit about that, Sam. Uh, well, Minecraft is one of those things that used to be really cool. Like, and I want to say it's still really cool, but my fourth graders actually use that phrase. Oh, yeah, remember when Minecraft used to be cool? So, 
you know, grain of salt. It's a great intro area because when you're working with kids in the world of Minecraft, most of them have some experience with it. So they feel some degree of ownership or authority. Uh, but this is actually one of, should we do a screen share thing here, Jeff? Sure. Okay. So let me find my window over here again. And then Josh, you're supposed to be singing the, uh, the transition music here. Okay, that's uh, the end of the need of... No, we're, we're done with the transition now, Josh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, okay, um, the Microsoft time. Make Code website has coding support for a number of different projects. The SparkFun Inventors Kit is an Arduino-style board that I use sometimes. Uh, the Chibi Chip, I haven't used yet, but it works for with paper circuits. The Wonder Workshop new robots, Q. Apparently, you can code through Make Code, as well as the Microbit the Circuit Playground Express, and the Minecraft. I'm actually showing off the Minecraft one today because it doesn't require an additional piece of hardware. Uh, but this is by far the simplest way to work with these pieces of hardware I've found so far. A few weeks ago, we did a show on the CS for All conference, which I think is going on this week. I saw some... This, some, this very day. This yeah. very day they're doing it. I saw some great window workshops out there. We did a show with the Cartoon Network, who was out there, and also the Scratch team. We had another member from the MIT Scratch team out there. And you're saying that to get your kids ready for coding, it is good to do uh, something using Scratch. Sam, what's, what's number two here on our list? The Animate Your Name tutorial from Scratch is great because it gets kids into Scratch and they're animating letters. Very simple. The letters are little characters. You put them on there, you make them dance. But once you have kids putting letters on a screen, they could be writing anything, right? They could be your spelling words. It could be vocabulary words. It could be just about anything. So the Animate Your Name tutorial is designed as a gateway for kids but I find it's a phenomenal gateway for teachers to see kind of the potential of working with Scratch as a way to display knowledge or to work with or apply knowledge or understanding. So animate your name could be a very simple spelling worksheet that you're converting into an online experience using Scratch. Cool. And, and, and yeah. am I right in saying that Scratch is not just for – the older crowd, um, I've been working on some of these Scratch Junior activities with my three-year-olds. Awesome. Yeah, Scratch is a great product, and I'm really excited because I just had an announcement that I think by summer, uh, this next summer, Scratch 3.0 is going to be out, and that's supposed to be cross-platform. So no matter what device you have, you will be able to build with Scratch, and I think it's also built to switch between the interface that you see in Scratch Junior and the interface you see in regular Scratch. That's pretty cool. Would that work the same thing you think with the PBS app? Definitely. Cool. So, Sam, we've talked about two things already to help us get ready for the Hour of Code. We've talked about Minecraft and the importance of it and how wonderful it is. And, of course, we'll have all the links in our show notes here. You can find Minecraft anywhere on Twitter at Playcraft Learn. We've talked a lot about using Scratch and how to animate your name. Uh, Sam, what is that next thing that we can do it has to do with robots, doesn't it? It does, but it has a lot more to do with Beyonce. I'm sorry, what? Beyonce. You've read Beyonce's. Yes, we're talking about Beyonce, the hour of Be Beyonce, the Beyonce, hour of Beyonce, the hour of code. If you want to learn it, you better put a grid on it. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I do either. But the third thing you can do to prepare your kids for coding is to put a giant grid of tape on your floor um, because it defines that space in a way that makes it programmable. This week, the kindergartners were working with the Bebots for the second time, and I rolled out my big grid. And this was, I think, um, yes. what is that, nine feet by 21 feet? Or I don't something know. like that. Uh, we weren't there. Um, with squares every six inches or so. Uh, but so it's an excessively large grid. Usually with Bebots, we use like little pieces of poster board. 
but I did the big grid because the V-Bots can remember up to 40 commands, and the big grid is big enough that they can run out of commands if the kids can now, you recently... track them that far. But I wanted everybody working kind of in the same space, be able to work in slightly large groups, um, and it's a very kind of novel experience. The kids come in, and there's this giant masking tape grid on the floor that was never there before. And at the end of class, they rip it all up. So it's really one of those kind of manufactured experiences. But really what they did was they each wrote like 10 or 15 computer programs that day, writing them out on the strip of laminated paper that's a little sentence strip, erasing them afterwards, taking turns programming it into the, the, into the robot itself. And by the end of the day, all of them were very confident users and programmers of the robots. They knew what it would do, and they knew how to get it where they wanted to get it. Now, you recently did a post on TeacherCast about this. I remember you did something where you actually put the picture of yourself with the blue tape on the grid. Yes, exactly. Now, Rob, when we're looking at this, I, I always come to you with the administrator questions. Is this something that teachers should be encouraged to do? And, and, if, and if one of your teachers came and said, I need your full support and a roll of blue duct tape, what would you say to them? Uh, sure. Here's, here's the tape. <laughs> I love that. Yes. yes. That's, that's, I mean, I don't, if someone is trying to be innovative and, and I have a kindergarten teacher using B-Bots with her kids and it, it's phenomenal to see them like just going through that programming sequence that Sam's talking about. It, it's, you know, I want to support that, but I also want it to spread because if it's something that's amazing happening in the classroom, I want that to go to the other three classrooms as well. So I'll actually even go into another classroom and say, why don't you go and see what's going on next door? Check it out. Um, and, you know, ask questions. Let me know what you need from me. I think that, that that's a, a great way to get something to spread or to get them to say, hey, can I borrow those B-Bots and bring them into my classroom to try and um, make a lesson and an activity in my room? So that's Exactly. The, the kindergarten teacher I was working with has used B-Bots in years past, but she said she wasn't sure how she was going to get started with them this year. She had some ideas for lessons, but really wasn't happy with kind of her orientation routine on it. So I'm like, hey, no problem. Let's do that in makerspace time. And even though I set up the big grid and the main activity, the kindergarten teachers still kind of took over running it and helping the kids with working it. And that was largely because I want them to just take that back into their classroom and use them daily. Yeah, that, that's uh, pretty but, cool. So I do have a question, though, and, and that I've been kind of going back and forth, just thinking about the hour of code. So I know one of the, the benefits is to give all students the opportunity to just play and to make and to be part of that. But if, if that's all you do is that one hour and then there's nothing else being done, it is, you know, I guess I'm saying, is it this, that one day just that fad and then we move on? I know that there's still benefits to it, but I'm trying to think like, Oh, I don't know. I think if you just do it for an hour, there really aren't much benefits. I mean, really, other than showing the kids what you're not letting them do most of the time. Like, that's I, brutal. I mean, for kids who don't get to to do it at all, it gives them at least an exposure to it. So It does, and they could choose to go back to it on their own. Even if they don't have Internet access at home, they might be able to get it at the library or something like that, right? I, I'm just, how, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get to is – we need to be, go beyond that. Not, I agree. <laughs> Are you saying that we need to go beyond the hour of code? Yes. Once more with feeling, Jeff. That's, Are, that's you, what I'm saying. I, I, don't ha I don't have any base on this on this amplifier here. Are you saying we need to go beyond the hour of code? Oh, hold on, Sam. I gotta let's let's put this up there. Sam, can you talk? Yes, sorry. Th there I it is. Talk. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Beyond the hour of code. That's a whole other podcast, though. I got to tell you. Occasionally, yeah, totally, agree. It's, totally agree. It's, it's a whole other podcasting concept. I'll put it that way. There we. Thank you. That's probably much more accurate. <laughs> um, 
that, that was that was a good plug there, Rob. I got to tell you. Thank you, Rob. That was very good. Yes, very, very good. Um, Your check is in the, the mail. Che- Unfortunately, it's a percentage. <laughs> it's, a per- <laughs> it's a percentage of the 30 bucks. OK, um, you know, look, and, and here's the big thing. And Rob is right. I, I got to say, what is the point if you're not going to keep up with it? Right. And this is no different than any other skill. You introduce something. You got to stick with it. I totally, totally understand that the hour of code is really that's supposed to be that gateway of look what we can do. Now let's build on it. And I know there's a lot of teachers out there that say, this is just something else we're going to do, or do I have to, or I don't have time for this because I'm doing everything else. And Sam, what do you say to these teachers that are sitting here giving you the, yeah, I don't have time for this. Like I'm, I'm an English teacher. I'm doing the park test. I've got 300 things to go and I'm in first grade. Like what, what, how do you, how, how do you bring in your blue tape with that? Well, you know, the best way is to show up with the blue tape and put the grid on the floor and have the kids play in front of them and make it happen. But um, usually it's like, would you like something to be easier and more fun? And if they say, no, I don't want anything to be easier or more fun. I say, okay, no problem. I'm going to be doing that over there because we do easier and more fun over there. As soon as you want life to be easier and more fun, show up over there. We're doing that. Is that by the copy machine, Sam? Um, It's generally outside of whatever room they're being grumpy in. (laughs) Josh, what do you think? You, you, you and I have, have similar positions here. Um, do you use the phrase easier and fun when it comes to, hey, let's bring some robotics into the classroom? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, we, we try and use the word engagement. Uh, we do associate fun with that. But uh, when it comes to, to any of this stuff, I think whenever we start something, we're really not – big on initiatives. We don't want to overload our teachers in our district and our district's been really good about that. So when we take on something, you know, we, we're going to stick with it. We're not, we don't go into fads. So when we did the hour of code for the first time, my first year, three years ago, we really didn't have much computer science through eighth grade. Now every kid pretty much K through eight is having pretty regular something related to coding and computer science throughout. Um, so it's happening. All kids are, are getting an opportunity to engage with it and get leveled up to, to more challenging things as they go. I'd say we're giving students some of the best experiences of any district I know of um, in terms of what we Ooh, have to offer Mic drop. Cool. We're, we're very fortunate, but uh, we, you know, we're not into fad. So like, they see this they it's it's something real the hour of code was great but we needed to take it further and we definitely have answered that bell uh there's more we can do but i'm really excited about the direction that side of things is going which is really nice because because all the kids are getting it in other places there's not as much pressure to figure out how we're going to fit it in other classrooms but it does happen we had our seventh grade uh advanced math teacher was doing human bee bots with her kids and she dressed up in a bee outfit and they it was phenomenal um and she's incredible and she should be on the podcast sometime to talk about some wicked awesome math stuff i yeah, think that I, that's I a great so. idea now now sam your podcast called uh, beyond the hour of code is um geared just to talk about what teachers can do on that 61st minute and beyond talk to us a little bit about it beyond the hour of code really ha- tries to help teachers see the curricular potential of coding And the opportunity, because I've seen coding in my classroom change the cognitive demand of assignments. In some cases, it slows kids down as they're working, allowing them to do a much more thoughtful job. Um, And in a lot of ways, coding can be a great opportunity to give the students an experience where the teacher doesn't know the most about what's happening in the room. So as a teacher, you can say the, exe- the instructions are on the website and you have to read them, which makes it an awesome literacy event. And when you have a question, I'm just going to come over and read the instructions with you because that's all, there, that's all we can do. Um, so those are reasons that I think it's really important to bring kind of coding into the classroom because as a teacher, I want the kids to be studying something that I don't know the answer to because it forces them to read. They can't take 
the lazy way out and ask me, and I can't take the lazy way out and tell them. We want to know what you guys think about coding and programming. We have a question for you as we're going to leave you with on each and every one of our shows. How are you preparing your kids for the hour of code? Are you doing coding activities with Scratch? Are you bringing up Minecraft EDU? Are you stripping down in your classroom? No. Are you stripping your classroom away and putting blue tape? Sam, any th comments on that? Uh, just make sure that if you start putting a bunch of tape on the floor that it's the right kind of tape and the what kind of tape are you putting on the floor person in your school doesn't get mad that you put the wrong kind of tape on the floor. But the biggest pro tip is this. All tape grids are temporary. Don't sweat it. If something's a little bit wrong, have the kids rip it up afterwards. The kids, it takes me 40 minutes to rip up a grid tape. It takes them two. It's wonderful math. It's like, oh, there's 20 of you? Great. Take two minutes. You've ripped up the entire tape grid. It would take me the same 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Josh, thank you so much for being here on the show today. Where can people get a hold of you? Uh, you can find my tweets at Mr. G Fact of the Day. Current fads include all of my annoying questions about math. Excellent. Rob, where can we find you in your annoying tweets? <laughs> Rob Pennington 9 is where you can find my annoying tweets. Sam, how about yourself? You can watch me argue with people on Twitter at S-A-M-P-A-T-U-E. As we get through the first marking period, head into the second marking period, we invite you guys to check out this show each and every Tuesday night on 8 o'clock p.m. on TeacherCast.tv. Of course, there's several great things that you can do also to be a part of the show. We love it when you find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voice message over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net and take a moment to subscribe to this and all of our shows over on TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Sorry, TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. Before we sign off, I want to remind you, as Sam just said, all tape grids are permanent. And of course, lastly, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.